Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India The module in progress is cell signaling mechanisms and we are focusing on G protein coupled signaling mechanisms which are also referred to as second messenger signaling mechanisms. The term second messenger is specifically used for these substances. The implication is that the ligand itself is the first messenger and the ligand stops short at the membrane binding to a membrane receptor and it produces its actions on the cell by elaborating one of these molecules which act as its second messenger. The first second messenger to be discovered was cyclic AMP with particular reference to adrenaline and its mechanism of action and Professor Earl Sutherland won a Nobel Prize in 1971 for his discovery of the cyclic AMP pathway describing the mechanism of action of adrenaline. In the previous modules, we have looked at how GS and GI type of subproteins, uh, type of G proteins act on adenyl cyclase to increase cyclic AMP levels within the cell, how GQ acts on phospholipase C to increase these two second messengers within the cell. Now we will be looking at how the GT subtype of G protein acts on CGMP phosphodiesterase, another membrane enzyme, to actually decrease CGMP levels within the cell. Let us first see how CGMP is formed in the cell. Just like cyclic AMP is formed from ATP by the action of adenyl cyclase, and remember, adenyl cyclase was the first membrane enzyme we discussed. Just like cyclic AMP coming from ATP, cyclic GMP comes from GTP or guanosine triphosphate. Under the action of a guanyl cyclase enzyme, the difference from adenyl cyclase is that while adenyl cyclase was a membrane enzyme, guanyl cyclase this type of guanyl cyclase is a cytosolic enzyme. It has the adjective soluble. So, since it has an adjective, you must realize that there must be another guanyl cyclase and of course that is on the membrane, but that is not the G protein coupled enzyme here. We will discuss that a little later. Here we have soluble guanyl cyclase, which will increase CGMP levels within the cell. CGMP is normally degraded to 5-GMP and that's how levels of CGMP within the cell will decrease and that's indeed what the membrane enzyme CGMP phosphodiesterase does. It decreases CGMP levels within the cell. CGMP of course we know can activate protein kinase G but it can also have independent effects independent of protein kinase G. The best known functions of cyclic GMP are in the rods and cones and in the vascular smooth muscle. In the rods and cones, CGMP levels are modulated by the G protein couple mechanism and that's what we will see first. In rods and cones, the actions of CGMP are independent of protein kinase G. At least the actions that we will discuss are independent of that of protein kinase G. The G protein coupled receptor or the protein on the membrane which responds to light is what we call rhodopsin in the rods. And light striking on rhodopsin will activate the G protein 
the GT type of G protein and that's what gets the special name transducin and the T here is actually for transducin. Once this G protein is activated, we know how the alpha subunit will move along the membrane and activate a membrane enzyme. The enzyme here is CGMP phosphodiesterase and that will reduce CGMP levels in the rods and cones. What is the effect? So we will now see what basal levels of CGMP in the rods and cones actually does. CGMP levels are quite high in let us say a resting rod that is one which is in the dark where there is no light activating that rod. CGMP levels will be fairly high and there are CGMP dependent channels on the membrane of rods and cones. These are non-specific monovalent cation channels and they will allow a steady invert current to operate in the rods and cones. Now, normally in a prototype cell or a, in a prototype excitable cell, the membrane potential is of the order of minus 80 millivolts and that is set predominantly by a potassium conductance in the cell and potassium is an outward current. In the rods and cones, in addition to this, there is a very high invert current, an invert conductance which keeps the cell fairly depolarized at about minus 40 millivolts. That is the resting potential of rods and cones. And when light strikes and CGMP levels reduce, these channels passing invert current actually close and the cell gets hyperpolarized. This is indeed interesting and peculiar because in all other neural transduction mechanisms, you would see that at the receptor level, the at the sensory receptor level. By sensory receptor, I am referring to a cell which senses that particular sensation. The first event would be depolarization. The rods and cones are an exception where the very first event after light striking the rods and cones is a hyperpolarization. How that produces an effect on the next cell in the pathway, we will see when we consider visual transduction. While considering CGMP, here we have seen how CGMP levels can be altered by a G protein coupled mechanism. There are yet other powerful ways in which CGMP can be altered and we will consider those mechanisms along with this session because they involve CGMP again. In the vascular smooth muscle, vasorelaxation is produced by an increase in CGMP levels. The issue of vasorelaxation is important because a loss of this basal vasorelaxed mode can lead to hypertension. There is a certain vascular tone constitutively at baseline at normal levels and if this tone becomes higher you can have hypertension and if the tone decreases suddenly you can have what is called vascular shock a sudden drop in blood pressure so maintenance of a certain vascular tone by opposing contraction and relaxation is important for maintaining a normal blood pressure and we will see CGMP signaling within the vascular smooth muscle cell. When we consider the vascular smooth muscle cell, we should consider, consider the endothelial cells along with because there is a lot of crosstalk going on. The three scientists who won a Nobel Prize in 1998 got their prize for figuring out certain pathways working through CGMP in the vascular smooth muscle cell. 
Robert Fuchs got realized that when acetylcholine is added onto vascular smooth muscle, if the endothelium is intact, that piece of muscle tissue will relax. And if endothelium is damaged, addition of acetylcholine will induce a contraction in that vascular smooth muscle. Therefore, Fuchscott said that there must be a substance released by the endothelium which relaxes the vascular smooth muscle cell. He called that substance endothelium derived relaxing factor or EDRF. Murid noticed that nitroglycerin, now nitroglycerin is given to relieve anginal pain. Anginal pain is chest pain coming up due to a spasm of coronary blood vessels. So there is less blood supply to the heart, ischemia of the heart and that causes pain. And this pain is reversible, <coughs> this ischemia can be reversed if the coronary vessels can be dilated. Nitroglycerin, which can relax blood vessels, Murid realized was doing so because it increased the levels of nitric oxide in the tissue. And Ignaro realized that nitric oxide was the same as endothelium derived relaxing factor. So today we know that the EDRF, which was first suggested by Professor Fuchgott, is indeed nitric oxide. Nitric oxide came to be declared as the molecule of the year in 1991 and it took another seven years for this trial to win the Nobel Prize. Another person who had done extensive work on these pathways and was not named in the Nobel Prize because Nobel Prizes are not given to more than three people. This person is Professor Salvador Moncada. The source of nitric oxide in the endothelial cell is L-arginine and L-arginine is acted upon by the enzyme endothelial nitric oxide synthase to elaborate nitric oxide within the cell. Nitric oxide being a gas diffuses through the membranes of the endothelial and vascular smooth muscle cells, enters the smooth muscle cell and activates the enzyme soluble guanylyl cyclase, thereby increasing CGMP levels within the cell. And that's one way in which nitric oxide induces relaxation in the vascular smooth muscle cell. There are other ways in which CGMP levels can increase in the vascular smooth muscle cell. And that is by activation of the enzyme guanylyl cyclase, which is found on the membrane, the membrane guanylyl cyclase. Just like we had a membrane adenylyl cyclase, there is a membrane guanylyl cyclase as well. While adenylyl cyclase was activated by G proteins, guanylyl cyclase is activated directly by the ligand, and the ligand in this case is atrial natriuretic peptide, a hormone secreted by, we can say the atria, the endocardial cells of the atria. This is also elaborated in other parts of the vascular system, but it is best referred to as the atrial natriuretic peptide, which can induce relaxation of blood vessels. And that acts by binding to the membrane guanylyl cyclase and activating it directly. That's how it increases CGMP levels within the cell. If you remember this old slide we saw in the very first session on cell signaling mechanisms, we had one condition where the receptor itself is an enzyme and the atrial natriuretic peptide binding to membrane guanylyl cyclase is a good example of that situation where the receptor <coughs> ANP receptor is indeed the enzyme itself and binding of ANP to that receptor will activate 
the guanylyl cyclase activity within that receptor. To summarize, we have seen three ways in which CGMP levels can be modulated within the cell. One is by a G protein couple mechanism where activation of CGMP phosphodiesterase in the membrane through a G protein can reduce CGMP levels in a cell. CGMP levels can increase by the action of soluble guanylyl cyclase which is activated by nitric oxide. CGMP levels can also increase by the activity of a membrane guanylyl cyclase which is activated by atrial natriuretic peptide. We will see two therapeutic conditions in which this knowledge is applied. We already know that vasorelaxants given for relieving anginal pain Vasorelaxants like sodium nitroprusside release nitric oxide and that's how they relieve coronary vasospasm and angina. There's one other instance where relaxation of blood vessels is important and that is in the treatment of impotence. Erection of penis occurs when it is filled with blood, when there is vasorelaxation of the blood vessels in the penis and that can be impaired in impotence. Treatment of impotence is by this drug called Viagra, the chemical name for which is sildenafil citrate and sildenafil is an inhibitor of the membrane phosphodiesterase, CGMP phosphodiesterase. By inhibiting this enzyme, it ends up increasing CGMP levels in the vascular smooth muscle cell and that is how it increases vascular supply and therefore erection of penis. So we have so far seen ways in which these G proteins act through these enzymes to elaborate these second messengers which produce their effects by activating one of those protein kinases or sometimes even directly. We will now move over, move over to phospholipase A2. We have already considered phospholipase A2 in the first lecture on cell membrane lipids. We looked at two phospholipases which acted on cell membrane lipids. One of them was phospholipase C and the second enzyme, membrane enzyme is phospholipase A2. And just like phospholipase C, Phospholipase A2 also acts on phosphatidyl inositol but at a different site. This was the cartoon of the phosphatidyl inositol molecule we saw earlier. This is phosphatidyl inositol. The membrane not only has phosphatidyl inositol but also phosphates of the phosphatidyl inositol. Here we have phosphatidyl inositol bisphosphate. While phospholipase C would act here to release inositol triphosphate and diacylglycerol, phospholipase A2 acts at this site and releases arachidonic acid from the phosphoinositides in the membrane. Arachidonic acid is a very, very important signaling molecule because once released, it is acted upon by either of these enzymes in the cytoplasm, cyclooxygenase or lipooxygenase to elaborate prostaglandin G or leukotrienes. The other prostaglandins are made from prostaglandin G. These are important mediators of inflammation and in another session we will consider the effects of prostaglandins in greater detail but for now non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, aspirin for example, are anti-inflammatory because they inhibit the enzyme cyclooxygenase and therefore reduce prostaglandin levels within the cell. And that is also the reason why they can induce peptic ulcer. Learn why. So phospholipase A2 
acts on membrane phospholipids, that is the phosphoenositides, to release arachidonic acid, and that forms prostaglandins and leukotrienes. While the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs inhibit cyclooxygenase enzyme, corticosteroids, which are used to treat inflammation, will inhibit phospholipase A2 itself. Much of the understanding of pathways involving arachidonic acid again came from the work done by Professor Moncarda, prolific work. Now, the big question now is whether phospholipase A2 is a G protein activated membrane enzyme. We now know that it indeed is and a ligand which acts through this pathway is bradykinin which will mediate inflammation. So it does that by activating a G protein subtype not specified or at least I'm not aware of which finally activates the membrane enzyme phospholipase A2. In summary, we've looked at G protein coupled mechanisms of cell signaling, that is ways in which ligands instruct a cell to perform an action. The G protein coupled mechanisms are also referred to as second messenger signaling mechanisms. Please note again that the term second messenger is reserved for these molecules. Though you would find that as you read, there are other substances which can qualify to be a second messenger, but terminology is important and we should restrict the usage of the term second messenger to these molecules. In the next session, we will consider the other ways in which a ligand receptor combination can activate a cell. We have just completed a discussion on G protein coupled mechanisms. Thank you for watching this NPTEL lecture.